Hello, everybody, and welcome to the ISET Learning Lab again. We have Shannon Ackert in the studio. He's Senior Vice President Commercial of Jackson Square. And he is also in that capacity responsible for technical services. Uh, Shannon is going to talk about aircraft maintenance and engine maintenance. And before I hand over to Shannon, I just wanted to mention a few things. On October 20th, uh, we have uh, another session uh, in the learning labs uh, with Norm Liu, former CEO and chairman of GCAS. And he's going to talk about the aircraft leasing landscape before, during, and after the COVID pandemic. And on the October 27th, we have uh, Rob Morris from Ascend talk about the aircraft on part-time redundancy or doomed. It's about the storage landscape. Uh, Rob is the head of consultancy for Ascent. And on November 17th, we have Doug Walker from Seabury, who's going to talk about the airline restructurings. I want to mention that you can ask questions during uh, Shannon's presentation. You can, that's uh, in writing. In, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you have uh, some call out buttons. You can click the one with two uh, call out bubbles and you can write in your questions and we go over those after the session. You can also enlarge the slides uh, that you, by clicking in the corner and dragging out so you get a, a closer view on Shannon's slides. Now, Shannon has worked for United Airlines as a system engineer, and he's been with McDonnell Douglas as a flight test engineer. He's been with GateX Leasing and was uh, responsible for risk, reward, and aircraft investments. Uh, and and uh, uh, Shannon holds a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Engineering from Emory Riddle and the Master of Business Administration from the University of San Francisco. So over to you, Shannon. Thank you very much, Niels. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as the case may be. A uh, pleasure to discuss this topic today regarding aircraft maintenance during times of uncertainty. And uncertainty is an under understatement. Uh, I have never in my career witnessed the implications of a pandemic to the industry as I have today. So I'm going to go through three main topics. I'm going to talk about the aircraft maintenance cost itself, go into a deep dive about the individual maintenance cost, and then discuss uh, how this uh, is affecting the MRO industry and also how it's affecting our industry in the in the aircraft leasing uh, space and also investors in general. So with that said, let's go ahead and give you a deep dive on the aircraft maintenance cost. I'm going to expand this a little bit for my benefit. So aircraft maintenance can be divided into three categories. They can uh, bridge out into the airframe maintenance costs, the components maintenance costs, and the power plant maintenance costs. And when you look at the subset of these high maintenance costs in the aggregate, uh, they constitute roughly about between 45 and 55% of the total direct maintenance costs of an aircraft. Um, looking at the airframe component, the, the heavy structural inspection is one of the big high cost events. These events are uh, performed every six to 12 years on average, depending on the aircraft type. And during this event, the aircraft is uh, effectively gutted out to expose the bare metal of the structure. And it's a very labor intensive process, which requires the removal of all the interior hardware. So for example, all the bins, all the floorboards, all the seats, all the monuments, the galleys, the lavatories, closets, all of that hardware has to come out to be able to expose the bare metal of the structure. Not only the bare metal, but also all the, the accessories that are built into the structure. For example, the components, the pneumatic ducting, uh, the hydraulic lines, the wire bundles, all of that has to be in exposed and inspected. So during the heavy structural inspection, the primary purpose is to perform um, 
the inspection of the structure to verify the integrity of uh, the uh, the the structure having any corrosion beyond any limitations that are outlined in the maintenance planning in the aircraft maintenance manual uh, to inspect for general fatigue both on a general visual sort of in a on a situations where you can see the actual fatigue cracks but in addition there are uh, specific types of hardware used to look into the structure effectively to do an x-ray on the structure to determine whether there's any internal cracks inside the airframe as well and then the last um, item to check for is for incidental damage to the structure itself uh, there are other tasks that are incorporated in the heavy structural inspections namely the heavy structural inspection also presents an ideal opportunity to incorporate numerous service bulletins that are issued or released by the individual manufacturers, whether it be the airframe manufacturer, the engine manufacturer, or the APU. But in general, during the heavy structural inspections, you may have anywhere from 20 to 30 service bulletins that are in the queue to be performed on the aircraft. Uh, given that most of the um, most of the the airplane has been made available, or the, the ideal spaces have made been made available to perform these uh, structural or these service bulletins. Uh, it's an ideal time to to conduct that event uh, during during the heavy structural inspection. And then, lastly, um, airworthiness directors are performed during the heavy structural inspection. Also it presents an ideal opportunity as the aircraft is fully exposed during that event as well. Um, downtime for a heavy structural inspection is typically anywhere from two to three weeks for a narrow body airplane and anywhere from four to six weeks from a wide body airplane. Moving into the component category, we have the APU, which stands for Auxiliary Power Unit. For those who are not familiar with what the APU performs, it's actually a gas turbine engine that resides in the tail section of the aircraft. And its main purpose is to provide auxiliary power in the form of uh, electrical power and pneumatic power. So it's a gas turbine engine that is coupled to a gearbox. That gearbox drives a generator. And it's also coupled to a load compressor, effectively an air pump which provides auxiliary pneumatic to the air conditioning and pressurization system of the aircraft. Um, these, uh, these gas turbine engines are monitored in terms of the hours and cycles. You can monitor these in from the cockpit, from the flight deck. You can track the uh, APU flight hours and the APU flight cycles that are logged on the unit as it's operating. Uh, in general, these units stay on wing from anywhere from 4,000 APU flight hours to 8,000 APU flight hours. The next component item is the landing gear, and typically landing gears are overhauled anywhere from 10 to 12 year intervals. Uh, they generally require about a month downtime to perform the teardown of the unit. You're going to go in and tear down, uh, replace bushings, replace bearings, inspect the cylinders. Uh, repair um, miscellaneous parts that come off of the unit during that uh, event. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the way that landing gear overhauls are accomplished is by the time the unit is removed from an airplane, usually the MRO already has a, an exchange unit in place in situ so that you can replace the landing gear once it's removed. So Oftentimes, you don't even have the original landing gear that's uh, reinstalled back onto the aircraft. Uh, in the initial presentation, I had omitted thrust reversers. And the reason why is because um, there, even though many lessors, including ourselves, do include thrust reversers in our term sheets, uh, it often doesn't get accepted by the lessee. And that largely has to do with the fact that um, thrust reversers really came into the into the four uh, in the last 10 to 15 years after there was a recognition, as you can see, that they are costly to maintain. Um, but 
we have not had a lot of success getting lessees to accept paying thrust reverse re uh, reserves. Um, in general, the reversers are on condition and they often require a full overhaul after 10, eight to 10 years of operation. Moving on to the engine performance restoration, for those who are not aware, an engine, a uh, commercial engine is really an assembly of multiple modules. For example, on the seven CFM 56 5Bs and 7Bs, uh, the modules will consist of the fan, the high pressure compressor, the combustor, the high pressure turbine, and the low pressure turbine. On all of Rolls-Royce engines, there's an additional intermediate pressure turbine and an inter intermediate pressure compressor. So each of these modules have are tracked by serial numbers. They track the time accumulated on each, each of these individual modules. And each of these modules have an associated soft time whereby they come in for restorative maintenance. The key point to make about the engine modules is, is that um, you don't necessarily always perform restorative maintenance on all of the modules during the same shop visit, but you typically perform restorative maintenance on the hot section modules, which uh, consist of the high pressure compressor, the high pressure turbine, and the combustor. But you may perform restorative maintenance on the fan and the LPT on an every other shop visit basis, and even in some circumstances, every third shop visit. Uh, the timing, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but timing for restorative maintenance is really a function of how the, the engines are operated. And as you can see, uh, restorative maintenance reflects a big overall weighting of the direct maintenance cost. And then lastly, we have engine life limited parts. These are parts that the engine manufacturer has defined as those that cannot be contained if there is a failure. Uh, these parts are subjected to very high rotational speeds under extreme pressure and temperatures. Um, their failure would uh, likely imply um, a catastrophic uh, uh, incident whereby if pieces of the LLP were to pierce through the engine casing, um, they can definitely also uh, cause damage to the airframe while in flight. And we've seen incidents of the cases of these uh, more recently, for example, a Southwest 737 incident where the fan, um, a fan blade released into, into the airframe structure. So the next slide is a summary of indicative maintenance cost for two aircraft types, the A320 and the 777. And just to go down a couple of issues, we even though we talked about these in, in detail, um, the one aspect about the airframe structural checks is you'll note, for example, on the A320, you have intervals of uh, 72 months and 12 years, and then on the 777, those intervals are at every eight years. The important thing to mention is that uh, the MPD, the maintenance planning document, does not really define a six-year or a 12-year structural check. Instead, what the maintenance plan document uh, does is it has a summary of each individual task. And for an airplane, they can be anywhere from 600 to 1,000 tasks that are performed uh, or defined in the MPD. But each task has a specific uh, defined interval or it can have a defined multiple intervals and it's incumbent on the airline to package these tasks to conform to their unique type of operation. So oftentimes when you see a six-year structural inspection, uh, the composition of the task in those checks may differ from one airline to another simply because um, the the tasks are really uh, reflective of the unique operation of an airline. And as it relates to the landing gear, you'll notice, for example, there are two intervals. There is a monthly calendar interval and there's a cyclic interval. And the policy with respect to when the overhaul is accomplished 
is based on whichever is more limiting. So if you're flying um, excess cycles per year, uh, that will be the limiting factor to drive the, the landing year into, uh, into an overhaul event. In the case of the A320, you can see that the overhaul is every 10 years or every 20,000 cycles, whichever is more limiting. So if you're flying in excess of 2,000 cycles per year, uh, let's say, for example, 2,500 cycles a year, then that's going to push or de-escalate your landing, landing your overhaul to an eight-year interval. I'm going to couple on the APU and on the engine modules, I'm going to couple the concepts of the time between events. Since these are on, on condition events, uh, the timing of these events are typically based on statistical uh, averages based on the operation or where or how these uh, um, equipments are being operated. If you take, for example, the engines, there can be a great degree of variability on the timing of these events simply because the engines are very sensitive to, to the degree of flight leg that you fly, if, whether it's a short flight leg or a flight leg or long flight leg. Uh, that often influences the timing of these events. The other parameter that comes into play is the uh, the area or the environment in which these uh, equipments are being operated. If you're operating, for example, in the Middle East, uh, that type of environment uh, causes a accelerated deterioration of parts and normally leads to a very um, impaired time on wing relative to, say, operating in a benign environment. And then lastly, you'll note, for example, on the LLPs, the range of flight cycles on the narrow body and the range of flight cycles on the wide body. The point to make is on the narrow bodies, you typically have uh, a much higher amortization or consumption of those flight cycles simply because narrow bodies fly uh, shorter flight legs relative to a wide body. And over the course or the economic life of the engine, it's not unusual to see a narrow body engine go through two to three full stacks of LLP. Whereas on the, on the 777 or a typical wide body, uh, you may go through the economic life of the asset and never replace an LLP. In the case of the 777 here, You'll note, for example, there's many or numerous LLPs that are rated at 15,000 cycles. And a typical 777 operates anywhere between 500 to 750 cycles per year. So it can take anywhere from 25 to 30 years to reach the limit on a LLP that's installed on a wide body. So through the economic life, it, be, it may never get replaced. It'll eventually get removed and recirculated back into the pooling or the spares pooling and be reused uh, given that Y bodies for, for a typical Y body engine, um, the bill gold or when it comes into the shop, the bill goals are typically anywhere from uh, 2,500 to 3,000 cycles. So uh, engines can easily be recycled uh, or LLPs can easily be recycled on Y body engines where typically on a, on a narrow body, you tend to consume the vast majority of the, the rated cycles on those components. So moving to the next. So what does maintenance cost mean to different parties? In the case of the aircraft lessors, the high cost maintenance events forms the basis for deriving our maintenance reserves. Uh, and maintenance reserves provide the lessors with a collateral cushion in the event of default. So there's the cash there that reflects or is accrued on the basis of the, the time consumed on those high dollar events. Uh, it, in addition, maintenance status also underpins the economic returns. So when you look at the economics of a lease, you discount the cash flows, but also you discount the residual value of the aircraft, which takes into account the maintenance status of the aircraft as well. Uh, and then lastly, uh, any sales proceeds of the aircraft will also take into consideration uh, the status of the high cost maintenance events. Uh, 
uh, to aircraft appraisers, to ISTAT certified appraisers. If you were to request a adjusted market value, which implies that you're taking into consideration the, the status of the maintenance, then though the appraisals will look at the condition of each of those high cost maintenance events and then adjust their market value to reflect uh, the status of those events. Uh, to airlines, uh, often the retirements of airlines are uh, timed to the eve of these high cost maintenance events and also uh, airlines that sell aircraft into the market would also take into consideration the status of high cost maintenance events as well. Um, I didn't include the manufacturers, but they are also another party that is, is vested in tracking maintenance costs. And oftentimes you'll see the OEMs will have their own personnel on site during heavy maintenance structural inspections. Uh, and what they're attempting to do is to um, tabulate or sample each of these aircraft and make a determination based on the findings of whether, for example, if there's any corrosion in a particular zone, whether there's corrosion or no corrosion, um, the OEMs then will take that data and then make uh, a decision on whether to extend or to de-escalate the task based on the findings at these major structural inspection events. So this slide, we talked about what influences the airframe cost, but, and one of the variables that comes into play is the aging of the airframe. And we, when we look at the, the factors that influence the aircraft maintenance costs, uh, when you perform maintenance, you have a host of scheduled maintenance tasks. These are effectively the routine tasks that are defined in the maintenance planning document. But as the aircraft ages, um, the rectification of these findings requires greater amounts of time and material. So you can imagine, for example, for a 20-year-old airplane, when you perform a routine task, uh, there's obviously a strong likelihood that you may find some discrepancy, and that discrepancy is gonna trigger a non-routine event to uh, to correct to correct the issue, and the the level of non-routines will typically go up as the aircraft ages. You'll often hear a term called the non-routine factor in this industry. So, for example, a non-routine factor of two implies that for every routine hour that you put in to um, into the inspection, uh, the consequence of correcting the findings will take an additional two hours. So as the aircraft ages, you'll see that the, the level of non-routine increases and, and um, there's also some incremental costs in material as well. Uh, the other component that comes into play here that adds to the cost of the airframe is the frequency of routine tasks. So for example, on the 737, uh, many of the nine-year structural inspection tasks um, are repeated at a shorter frequency. They're repeated every six years. So by virtue of having this shorter interval, you, you create a, re a higher frequency of tasks that need to be performed as the aircraft ages, and that adds to a layer of cost as well. And the other component that comes into play is that as the aircraft ages, for example, as it reaches a certain cyclic threshold, um, the OEMs will typically add on an additional layering, layering of supplemental inspection tasks. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the 737, um, Air, uh, Boeing, has an aging maintenance aircraft program that effectively consists of supplemental tasks that are performed above and beyond the normal tasks that are defined in the MPD. So you have an additional layering of tasks that are added once the airplane reaches a cer certain cyclic threshold. 
And then lastly, as the aircraft ages, um, the fuel burn increases due to the, the over time the airplane uh, accumulates weight um, and drag typically increases as the aircraft ages. You can imagine, for example, on many of the flight control surfaces, a lot of the seals begin to wear out. And so uh, over time, the, the burden of the weight and drag uh, starts to increase. And when you put all of these components together, all of these variables together, it, there comes a point where it becomes cost prohibitive to operating these airplanes as a result of the, the incremental cost to maintain them and the incremental cost to operate them. The same logic applies to engines, but with engines, as they age, um, the variable that really affects the cost is the, the increase in the material cost. So as the aircraft, as the engine ages, you have a dis, uh, disproportionate amount of material on parts that experience higher deterioration rates and scrap rates. And um, oftentimes you will find that an engine's um, total cost, the material component of that cost, uh, represents anywhere from you know 75 to 85 percent of the total cost of a shop visit. The other component that comes into play is that as the engine ages, its time on wing performance actually decreases. So uh, when you first operate an engine, it operates in what's in what's referred to as the, the honeymoon period. Its newness allows it to stay on wing for uh, a much longer period of time. And to, by way of example, for uh, on the seven, CFM 56-7Bs, it's not unlikely to get a first run of anywhere from 15 to 20,000 cycles. But as they come into the shop, the engines are typically built to a lower standard, a lower build gold standard. Um, anywhere from eight to 12,000 cycles is a typical build gold standard for a narrow body engine. So the time on wing is compressed and so the, the uh, denominator, the time, is reduced, and that, in effect, increases your unit cost, your, your cost per flight hour. And lastly, the engines that go into the, to the shop often require higher rates of inspection and repairs. Uh, these repairs aren't you know, necessarily cheap. You know, when you replace a, a part and you decide whether you want to repair it, oftentimes the, the process for repairing a, a compressor blade or a high pressure turbine blade uh, is very time consuming and very expensive. And so the repair component adds significantly to the cost of an engine shop visit as well. So now we segue into the aircraft uh, the uh, aftermarket implications. And if you look at the cost inputs of maintenance events, uh, they're generally labor and material, but the weighting of them is different. So for example, on the airframe, it's a predominantly labor intensive uh, maintenance event. And uh, for the landing gear, APU engine and the LLPs, obviously for LLPs, it's 100%. But material is a main driver for the, the, the um, particularly for the engine performance restorations. And as the engine ages, the, uh, the uh, owner of those assets typically has a decision to use original equipment parts, or they can use, use serviceable materials, or they can use non-OEM parts, which is our PMA parts. Um, so the, the decision to go to decide on which uh, part to use, whether it's a new part, a non-OEM part, that largely hinges on where the engine is in the maintenance cycle. And um, what we'll talk about later on is what the implications of this pandemic has had on the decisions of what types of labor and material inputs 
to apply to these maintenance events. So, but the key to the MRO market is a steady reliance on the feedstock uh, of these maintenance events. So the MROs, the landing gear MRO centers, the engine MRO centers rely heavily on a steady stream of feedstock to sustain their business. And if we take in consideration the environment that we're in, one can argue that this pandemic has created a distressed market for feedstock since uh, what we've seen almost on a weekly basis is a, announcements by airlines to fast forward retirement of their fleets, of their older fleets. And uh, many airlines are storing their aircraft. For example, more recently, we've heard uh, American Airlines um, intention to retire their older 737-800s. Uh, and we've heard from many airlines recently on the uh, recent retirements of the Boeing 747-400s. So in effect, what's happening is, is these airplanes are being parked. Much of the material is being recycled into the, the into the spares pool, into third-party spares pool environment. So the engines are going back into the spares pool. Uh, many of these are sold into the second or the, the tertiary and secondary markets. And so in situations that we have a surplus of these maintenance of these um, equipment going into the market, uh, what that has created is uh, situations where aircraft on the eve of their maintenance events, major maintenance events, are being permanently retired or they're parked or stored. And then the associated parts, the components, the rotable assemblies, the engines with green time rem remaining are being um, either retained as a spares for or bought and sold uh, typically below their intrinsic value. So this is an example of the, of the engine um, cycle, the engine life cycle pre-COVID. So if you look at this illustration, you'll see there's three different phases. The first phase represents the growth phase where we have new aircrafts, uh, new gen aircrafts entering into the market. You have, for example, more uh, before the, the uh, pandemic, uh, Boeing and uh, Airbus were producing in excess of 50 neural bodies per month. So you had a very steady stream of aircraft coming into the market, representing the growth phase. And then you, the, those engines that are in the mature phase or the stabilized phase, those are the ones that really represent the, the bread and butter for the MRO industry, since these are the engines that are going into the shop um, for reoccurring maintenance. And in phase three, we have the scenario where there is a, the phase out of the aircraft and the engines itself. Uh, during this particular period, we typically have uh, engines that are uh, going into the shop, but not necessarily being uh, built to the typical standards that you would see during phase two, during the mature, mature phase. So during the pre-COVID environment, the fundamental relationship between the feedstock growth and the maintenance aftermarket service was very predictable. Um, you can look and extrapolate out into the future and make some reasonable predictions about the volume of aircrafts coming in for heavy checks, the volume of engines, coming in for a uh, performance restoration. From the management consideration perspective, if you, if you look at how one would assess the, uh, the, the management of engines during the growth and stabilization phase, the objective really was to preserve asset value so when engines were coming into the shop, the goal was to build to minimize the dollar per flight hour uh, DMC. And generally we want to focus on preserving the asset value by using uh, 
uh, original equipment parts and repairs. Uh, you want to invest in the latest service bulletins, uh, in the latest product improvement modifications and technologies, and you would opt to choose to replace parts over repair. So the goal during the growth and stabilization phase was to preserve the asset value to the highest standard possible. Uh, management considerations during the end of life of phase was really a preservation of cash. Uh, in those circumstances, you would tend to build to minimize shop visit costs. You would, um, it, you would maximize the usage of the LLPs. You'd weigh the benefits of purchasing, swapping, green time engine modules. You'd weigh the benefits of using used service material, uh, non-OEM parts, and DER repairs. So the goal here was not to gold plate the asset uh, as much as to get as much, extract as much life and consumption out of the asset as possible. So when we go into the, the pandemic scenario, so what we find is that as a result of the cutback in the productions, what we've heard from Boeing and Airbus, you have a announcements of retirements and storage of fleets, and then you've had announcements of accelerated retirements of entire fleets as well. The net effect of that is a reduction in the quantity of engines that are going into the critical phase two stabilization mature phase, and also uh, a reduction of the engines that are uh, being phased out as well during the normal course of cycle. So the management considerations, or the, I would say the fundamental relationship between the feedstock and growth and the maintenance aftermarket services during this particular phase is very unpredictable. Nobody really knows for certain at this point in time how many of these engines are going to be reintroduced into the market. Um, and so the OEMs certainly are having a difficult time coping with this type of environment. So the management considerations during the pandemic is obviously every, every uh, head of maintenance, every uh, CEO, CFO of an airline today is trying to preserve cash. And so the objective during this period of time is instead of maximizing your investments to, um, to maintain high asset value, what you're doing now is your goal is preservation of cash. So you're building to minimize your shop visit costs. You're more likely going to try to use as much of the LOPs as possible. You're looking at possibly weighing the benefits of purchasing or swapping green time modules. And you're also weighing the benefits of using used serviceable material, PMA parts, and DER repairs. And the management considerations during the end of life phase is your goal is to early retire these assets and you your objective would be to manage the green time spare parts and modules to the, to the extent that you would want to get as much consumption out of these uh, modules as possible and the parts as possible. So you burn off all the soft time available on the green times modules. You would sell or swap green time modules uh, or sell serviceable parts and components. So a good example of this scenario would be imagine you have an engine that's coming into the shop you have two alternatives you have the the limiters are 12,000 cycles and 7,000 cycles um, and 2,000 cycles so your alternative for this particular situation is you can build the engine to 12,000 cycles or you can build the engine to 7,000 cycles um, and the the implications are quite significant. If you decide to build to 12,000 cycles, you're going to invest in restoring an additional module. You're, you're going to invest in replacing additional LLPs. So the consequence of that decision is you have a higher absolute cost. So your total shop visit cost goes up and that in effect reduces or minimizes your DMC or dollar per flight hour. The other alternative is to minimize your bill gold to 7,000 cycles, 
and in, in effect that reduces your total absolute cost but it actually results in higher unit cost so more than likely in this type of pandemic in an effort to preserve cash uh, you will opt to minimize your cash outlay and go with option two to build the engine to 7,000 cycles. The other alternative is imagine, for example, you have two engines with green time modules and you're looking at the, uh, the possibility of combining the green time modules from two engines into one engine. So in effect, what you've done here is you've created a serviceable spare engine by combining the green time modules from two, two engines. The net effect of both of these scenarios is, uh, is that you've, um, you've effectively stripped out two engines from the MRO, uh, from the engine MRO, because the intent is really to burn off all of the green time uh, time remaining on the serviceable spare uh, and uh, avoid sending these two engines into the shop. So we're in the last phase. We're gonna talk about the investor implications. And before we do it, I just wanted to sort of provide a, a background on some number of terminologies that are used in this industry. So for those who aren't familiar with the current market value, that represents the appraiser's opinion of the most likely trading price, but it's under the current market conditions. So if you were to ask an ISTAT certified appraiser for a current market value, his opinion is reflective of the current market conditions today. But that can reflect the, in times of distress, for example, in times of, the, of this pandemic, current market values can also reflect uh, the part out value of the aircraft and the distress value. If you look at the uh, part out value, it's, it implies that the market value really is, is a reflection of the estimated selling price of the aircraft and the engine and the major assemblies. And if you look at the stress value, distress is really a scenario where the, the buyer is looking at obtaining some leverage to get a very competitive price. So the perception is that the seller is being under duress to sell due to factors that materially reduce the bargaining leverage of the seller. Um, distress values, incidentally, can be anywhere from 20 to 50% below current market values in a, in a typical balanced market. The other concept I wanna talk about is maintenance status. So if you look at the maintenance status, really it's a representation of the, the uh, depreciation, depreciation profile of each of those individual maintenance events, but they are slightly different. So for the airframe, heavy structural inspections and the landing gear, which are subject to a hard time fixed interval, the depreciation profile is, is uh, pretty straightforward. You, you accomplish these typically coinciding with the timing of those events. So you use up 100% of the maintenance and then you recapitalize it to 100%. Uh, with the case of the on condition events for the engine and the APU, uh, oftentimes as I alluded to earlier, you don't necessarily perform restorative maintenance on all the modules. And in effect, what you have is you have scenarios where the uh, status is restored to a, not 100% due to some nominal percentage below that over the course of the engine's life. And then with engine LOPs, uh, typically what happens with LOPs is that you rarely consume 100% of an engine life. Um, so when an engine comes into the shop, what will often happen is you discard uh, green time. Typically, it's anywhere from 5 to 15 percent of available green time that's on that LLP. And the 
the uh, maintenance status really is a reflection of the time remaining. So when we use the term maintenance status, we're often alluding to the condition of maintenance remaining uh, on each of these individual maintenance events. So if we give maintenance status and we expand this concept to valuation, to say current market valuation, then we reflect in the case of a full life current market valuation, it takes into consideration the, the fact that each of those major maintenance events are actually have been zero timed. Uh, so you have the assumption that the airframe is fresh from a heavy check, the landing gear is fresh from an overhaul, LOPs are all 100%. This is not a scenario that is realistic, but when you account for the fact that uh, a lessor, for example, will have cash to cover the consumption of these maintenance spends, then the cash plus the residual condition will often imply that you have a full life status, a full life maintenance status uh, built into the, the economics. The half-life is, is effectively assumes that uh, all of those maintenance events are halfway between their major overhauls and that the life limited parts, for example, have used up half of its life. So half-life is really a, a way to conduct an apples-apples comparison of airplanes to, uh, to gauge uh, value differences between them. And what you see there below is the equation that's used to estimate uh, changes or relative differences from half-life status. So this was an example, for example, to give you some perspective of the the implications of maintenance status on an airplane. This, In this example, it's an A320, 2010 vintage. And the only difference between the two is the utilization. So one airplane is operating at 3,000 flight hours and 1,000 cycles. And the other one is operating at 3,500 hours and 1,700 cycles. And you can see that just solely based on the uh, the operational profile of the airplane, uh, the, the actual maintenance status value is, is significantly different, even though they're the same vintage. So this is a way that you can correlate differences. The maintenance status is a way you can correlate differences between aircraft of the same vintage or different vintages um, based on utilization or based simply on the, the year of vintage. And next one. And this really kind of leads to the, the main point about maintenance status and what we're seeing in this type of environment. So imagine, for example, you're an airline and you have a number of aircraft in your portfolio. And uh, what this illustration depicts is sort of the aggregate forecast of maintenance status uh, of the um, of an aircraft and imagine for example you've got uh, multiple airplanes in your fleet and you one of the airplane is in scenario number one so it's right on the eve of major maintenance events and you have a second airplane that just came out of those major maintenance events um, what are the decisions that you're going to make? Well, likely, and what we've seen, clearly what we've seen evidence of, is that if you're in the, uh, if you're in the first scenario, you're likely going to be stored uh, temporarily or even parked permanently. Um, we have cases where airlines have asked lessors to pick up the cost of those future ma maintenance events, meaning, uh, our airplanes would be in uh, circumstance number one, and the airline is in bankruptcy. And in order for us to agree to keep those airplanes at that lessee, uh, they're asking for contributions, either part or whole, to pay for the upcoming heavy maintenance visits. But those that are in scenario number two, those are the ones that the airlines are keeping and, um, and operating during 
during this period of pandemic. So that uh, when we look at these scenarios, you know, you have in times of uncertainty, the maintenance investment value is minimized for number one, airlines may elect to park or store the aircraft to avoid recapitalization of the high cost maintenance events. And in case of number two, where we're in a normal environment in capacity shortage of conditions, the maintenance investment value is maximized so planes keep on flying and the issue of maintenance status really takes on a lesser significance. So we got two more slides to illustrate the investment considerations. The same, it's the same chart as the engine life cycle, but uh, it's really structured for investors. So if you look at the pool of investors and aircraft investments, you have uh, those like Jackson Square Aviation. We focus on the airplanes that are new liquid aircraft, and we buy them through speculative orders. We have an order book with 737 MAX, uh, but most of our airplanes are bought through the sale lease back uh, market and often with strong credits. So our business model is predicated on focusing on the initial maintenance cycle. Uh, we tend to keep these airplanes for a short period of time. We do retain some of them, but we also trade off many of them on the eve or uh, with uh, some degree of stub life remaining on the lease. Uh, investors number two, these are investors that are more focused on higher yield. So they're focused on the aircraft that are midlife and uh, oftentimes are with weaker credits, but their, their, their business model is generally focused on uh, capturing a higher return uh, based on the risk profile of the credits that are in this particular segment. Uh, and then we have the third investor, classification investor. These are more focused on the part out market, uh, the aftermarket, and they tend to buy aircraft that are at the tail end of their economic life, short stub lease with the, the goal of selling the used serviceable material on the engines or um, on the APUs and landing gears. So the, when you think about the, the, the relationship between capital investment, income growth, and traffic growth in this particular scenario pre-COVID, it's pretty predictable since everybody can at least have a good uh, or a reasonable uh, forecast of what's coming down the pipeline in terms of available opportunities in the sale leaseback market and available opportunities through speculative growth. Pre, when we go into the COVID environment, then what we see is the reaction from the likes of ourselves is we obviously focus on deferrals and cancellations of our orders. Um, we're a bit more opportunistic in our sale leaseback opportunities. We're not as aggressive as we used to be. Uh, for the investor that's in the mature or midlife, uh, investing in midlife assets, uh, they will tend to focus on managing those assets throughout the economic cycle um, and focus on um, retaining those assets to the extent possible that they are not forced to uh, impair those uh, given that many of those assets are not being operated uh, or are parked or retired. And then lastly, in the part out, many of those investors have to focus on the aftermarket sale of parts in a surplus environment, uh, which, the, which one could imagine uh, is, is, um, is, 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 is very uh, unpredictable given the, the, the volume of airplanes that are in this, in this market, the volume and quantity of parts that are in this market. Um, and so the fundamental, rela fundamental relationship between the capital investment, income growth, and traffic growth, and this is, is obviously very uh, unpredictable. So with that said, the last slide is just a summary of the acronyms. Uh, 
And with that said, I can move to the, and close this and move to the questions. Okay, we have a few questions, Shannon. Thank you for that so much. Okay. Uh, before we go into uh, some of the quite detailed questions, I just wanted to ask a couple of uh, kind of uh, overriding issues here. First of all, how do you uh, compare maintenance value in the aircraft to maintenance cost? I, I, I suppose that at some point during the life of the aircraft, that relationship where you could equate cost to value uh, breaks apart. So how do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, the way so the way we think of maintenance value is because we derive maintenance reserves to uh, to cover these these high cost maintenance events. The way that we derive these values is based on uh, largely for new technology airplanes. They're based on guidance for the OEM, and then on the legacy airplanes, uh, we we usually compile uh, data. Uh, for example, from maintenance reserve claims, we compile that data and then come up with an assessment of what the the market costs are for these um, for these maintenance events. But does the value reflect the actual cost? That's a question that you, I think depends on the the condition of the market. So when we're in a we're in a very strong market, investors are likely to pay uh, not necessarily dollar for dollar, not necessarily a premium for that for that value, for that cost, but um, you can argue that they will they're willing to pay a, a a price that reflects at least an approximate uh, estimate of that of that maintenance cost as well. So. The, the cost of maintenance, the value, and it, very much like the aircraft itself, oftentimes gets discounted depending on the status of the market. Um, and in a distressed market, nobody's going to pay a premium for high cost maintenance events. Um, you might be lucky to, to get a fraction of what you've invested in those maintenance events. So I would say that in general, it really depends on the condition of the market. If there's a lot of demand, you'll get a, a value that is closely correlated to the cost itself, but, but not quite dollar for dollar. And then in situations that we're in today, um, the value of maintenance can be heavily discounted into the cost of, the, uh, into the cost of an aircraft. Thank you. So as you look at the market for maintenance services, I think there are three principal players. It's the airline themselves that have facilities to do this. You have the, the third party uh, MROs and you have the OEMs. Now, how? what is the trend here? I mean, are you seeing a trend towards more and more OEM uh, creation of maintenance services or, or where is this heading? Yeah, you do. What you've seen over the course of the last 10 to, 10 to 20 years is uh, maintenance is really not a core business of the airline. There's few airlines today that have retained their maintenance organization. Delta is one of them, Lufthansa, American. Uh, but in general, many of the carriers have offshored that capacity to third party MROs. Um, and for the, for, the, for the simple reason is that it's really not a core business of an airline to do maintenance. Delta Tech Ops and Lufthansa have made it a, uh, a, a, a business unit. And particularly with Delta, Delta Tech Ops, um, they've had a lot of success with their maintenance organization performing third party maintenance. It's actually the, um, from a business perspective has been a very successful venture for them. Um, but I would say that the airline, most airlines today are looking to outsource most of their maintenance. If you look particularly on the engine maintenance, uh, 
uh, most new technology um, engines we see at least at least in in our experience uh, many of those engines are on flight hour agreements and for the simple reason that the OEM number one doesn't want to take the risk of performing those in-house secondly they don't really understand how the maintenance costs are going to evolve on those engines so they're playing it safe and uh, inducting those engines into a flight hour agreement so i would just say that um, over time you'll probably see the status quo uh, of more airlines outsourcing maintenance and perhaps even now during this crisis it's even more relevant given that i would imagine most airline CEOs are looking at other ways to uh, save money going forward. And so I wouldn't be surprised if you see decisions along the lines of outsourcing more and more maintenance um, to MROs, third party and, and original MROs. But uh, is there a, a tendency you think that uh, a big share will go to the OEMs themselves that big, uh, become more? involved in the aftermarket services? Yeah, I would say that's the case for the engines. Um, even though you have engine OEMs that have, uh, for example, CFM has uh, third party providers uh, for engine overhaul services. But going forward, what we've seen is many of the OEMs are striking up um, their uh, striking up a uh, agreements with third-party MROs to share in that uh, share in that maintenance services. So you look, for example, uh, in the case of Pratt, in the case of CFM, uh, they're setting up a satellite of network MRO networks where um, they have. A, a, a degree of, of a joint venture element to it as well. So the, um, the, the, the days of pure third party engine OEM are, are diminishing in my opinion from my observations um, since the OEMs really want to capture a larger share of that business. But just keep in mind, if you look at the engine OEM business model, um, OEMs sell the engines to the manufacturers at, at a loss. At best, they sell it at a break even. So they're, they're really dependent on the, the aftermarket to s s sustain their business. And um, so going forward, they're trying to, to corral, to, to gain a greater degree of leverage over. Do you think, Sean, that there is going to be a, uh, some of the independent MROs that are going to face financial difficulties, just like uh, the, the airlines and maybe the Lesors, in because of the crisis. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, again, if you just fall back on the engine MROs, I, I really believe that this is a wake up call for them. It probably even puts into question their business model. I'm not apt to predicting what will happen in the future. But no doubt, I would imagine many of the, the uh, CFOs of a engine OEM are reevaluating this model because this concept of, of selling the engine at a loss and then expecting to recoup your investment over a, long, for a very prolonged period of time it just may not make sense. And, and this may be a wake up call for, for engine OEMs to reevaluate this. Um, it's possible, for example, that uh, they may decide that uh, selling the engine at a loss doesn't make any sense. Um, going forward, they're, they're going to have to have some means to recoup their investments quicker. So I think when you look at the dynamics today, I mean, just imagine with all the airplanes that are stored and parked, what that has done to the feedstock for the engine OEMs, for all of the OEMs, and you know, land, whether it's landing gear, APU, uh, all that feedstock has 
has completely come to a halt uh, in, and well, not a complete halt, but certainly slow down. And so I think all of these MROs are reevaluating their business model in light of this pandemic. I don't believe that the, particularly with the engine OEMs, that this can be sustained for the long term. Okay. Do you see a trend uh, away from the surcharging maintenance reserves to uh, to OEM administered uh, power by the hour arrangements, so to speak? Well, we see that currently with the engine OEMs. We we have established flight hour agreements with m numerous engine OEMs, uh, so there you can argue there. There. Um, what I will say is that the lessors are still sensitive about um, who owns that cash. So if you look at the latest flight hour agreements, uh, one of the changes that have been made in, the, in these agreements is the, uh, the capability of the lessor to have access to, the, to those paid in, uh, the paid in credits. So the, the fact that the cash, as I noted earlier, uh, plays a big role in our economics. The maintenance reserves do play a role in our economics. Um, it, I don't think we're, most lessors are just going to readily accept universally to have all of the, these maintenance events be subjected to a flight hour agreement, unless there's a very clear uh, recourse to having access to that paid in cash, uh, which is something that the engine OEMs have been able to accommodate it with. And that's something I personally don't see that on the horizon with certain OEMs, uh, just, yeah. just because yeah. um, it doesn't make economic sense. Uh, Sean, there's a, there's a controversial subject on PMA parts, okay, and uh, Nadim Fatale has posted a question that is quite technical, so I, I think I'm going to read this question now as he wrote it. So, so Nadim says, in light of the many airlines currently accepting and even promoting test and comp PMAs and DER repairs, and he mentions a bunch of airlines that does this, and that financiers are having to take valuation hits for aircraft they place at airlines requiring financing to allow PMA DR repairs. And that most airlines who do not accept alternate parts state limitations imposed by financiers. Do you think financiers will ever start to allow all of their customer operators to use alternate parts in order to open up the marketability of aircraft with these parts installed on them? thus removing the presence of such parts as the reason to reduce the valuation of aircraft that ha have these parts. Yeah, I would, I would say it depends on who the investor is. If, in that last slide when we we're talking about the specific types of investors, if you take us, for example, we're, we're the type of investors that are focused on new generation airplanes. Um, so our our business objective is to avoid the usage of PMAs or DR repairs simply because we trade out our leases and we don't want to take any chances that a prospective buyer will impair the value of the lease because we've allowed for PMA parts. We know we have experience with a number of lessees that have basically told us under uncertain terms that they're going to use PMAs. But the trade-off with, with a number of these lessees is that we've assumed that the aircraft are going to remain at that lessee for, throughout their economic life. So if you take, a, for example, a typical US carrier, will we allow PMAs? More than likely, yes. But it's predicated on the assumption that we, we assume that these aircraft are going to remain there through their economic life. Whereas with most lessees, um, we assume that these airplanes are ultimately going to be rotated into uh, a tertiary or, or another credit uh, 
and any any buyer of of these assets is going to be very mindful of the the, the status of the uh, PM, uses of PMAs or DR repairs, particularly in the engines. Um, so we prohibit it, but again, that's us as an investor. Now, when you start shifting over to the investors that are in the part out market, I would imagine those investors too are going to be very, very adamant about, um, about not purchasing uh, engines or landing gears or whatever with PMA parts because their business is predicated on selling those used parts in the uh, in the aftermarket. Where you do see some logic here is if you have some older aging aircraft and the the only mechanism that you can keep these assets on lease is to allow the airline to use DR repairs, um, then that trade-off will come into play in the decision-making. I can say that from experience because having worked for a previous lessor, we managed a securization with some very old airplanes. And um, many of those airplanes were literally on their last leg. And for those situations, we went ahead and, and granted the lessee the the right to use PMAs and DR repairs, but um, those are exceptions. I still believe that there are other investors that would uh, factor that exception, and particularly now during the circumstance that we're in. Um, so it's so it really again it depends on who the investor is. Um, so I would just say that. There's probably those that will relax those standards in order to sustain their uh, sustain their business or keep the airplane on lease for a period of a period to end the economic life of the asset. Yeah. Um, Sandra at Denver Riddle has asked you several questions, but I do think when I look at them that most of those questions have been answered in your very thorough presentation. Uh, and Janet DeMel is asking if it's a norm now that the source charge maintenance reserves for thrust reversers. No. Um, so we, in, we will include thrust reverser reserves in our wide body term sheets. Um, but I'll be honest, we haven't had a single lessee accept it. Um, and the the reason is is because it has to do with the competitive nature of this business. Many years ago, and particularly during the global financial crisis, where uh, there was very few competition in the market for lessors, there was only a few lessors out there. Typical narrow body will have anywhere from 20 to 30 left. We will not pay. Okay, I think we are having some trouble with the Shannon's audio. But the good news is that we've come basically to the end of this very extensive and thorough presentation. And there are a few questions left. There was one from Joel Wagner about the frequency of the shop visits with the age of the aircraft. But it, it's quite technical. And I would say I'm sure that uh, you can all contact uh, Shannon with specific questions. His presentation is available on the ISTAT site, or will be made available on the ISTAT site, so you can download that. And with that, I want to thank everybody for calling in, and I want to thank uh, Shannon for this very, very thorough presentation. And see you back then. Uh,
with uh, Norm's Norm Lewis presentation. Thank you very much. Bye bye.